In this video, we are talking about solutions, what they are and how they form. So first of all, the definition of solution consists of a solvent and one or more solutes. Um, and what's a solvent, what's a solute? In general, the solvent is what there's the most of, but let's look at it a little more closely. If there's a liquid and one or more solids, you know, like salt or something like that involved, then the liquid's always going to be the solvent and the solid or the solids will be the solute. The solvent is, think about it as what's doing the dissolving and the solutes are what are being dissolved. Now if there's two or more liquids, the liquid that there's the most of will be the solvent and the other liquid will be the solute. And the same is true if you have two or more solids or gases. Whatever you have the most of will be the solvent and the others will be the solutes. For example, let's say we have some salt, sodium chloride over here, dissolved in water. Well, sodium chloride starts out as a solid and it's in water, which is a liquid, so that means that water is a solvent, sodium chloride is the solute. The um, CH3OH, this is methanol and it's a liquid here. And so, you know, this is trying to show that there's, you know, three waters for every one methanol. So because there's more water than there is methanol, and they're both liquids, we would say that water is the solvent and methanol is the solute. Now, we're going to talk about what are called intermolecular forces because that's going to let us explain how solutions can form. So there's three basic types of intermolecular forces, dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding, which by the way is a really misleading term because hydrogen bonds are not really bonds, they're intermolecular forces. So what's the difference? Well, an intermolecular force is a force of attraction between separate molecules. Now that's as opposed to, you might call the, uh, the other kind of force an intramolecular force, I-N-T-R-A, and that would be within the molecule, inside of it, and that would be, those would be bonds inside of the molecule. Intermolecular forces are, are a little bit farther out. They're between the different molecules. And you can think about this as like interstates and intrastates, if, well, if you want to call them that, roads. An interstate is a, a road is one that goes between different states. It connects different states, California to Oregon to Washington, etc. Whereas an intrastate road would be one that's, that just connects points within the state. So intramolecular bonding versus intermolecular forces. Here we're talking about intermolecular forces. And those the three, I'll talk about this bottom one in a second. Dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. One of the important things to know is that dispersion is the weakest of these three, hydrogen bonding is the strongest, and dipole, dipole forces are intermediate. Now, the next thing to know is what kind of molecules have what kind of intermolecular forces. Well, first of all, dispersion forces are the weakest in Every species has them. As long as there, it ends up, as long as there's any electrons at all, <clears throat> then there are dispersion forces. So everything has them, but they're the weakest. Dipole-dipole forces are stronger than dispersion; they're intermediate. But the only molecules that have dipole-dipole forces between the molecules are ones that are polar. And you remember we talked about how to tell if a molecule is polar or not, right? Basically, if the poles, the the difference in, in electronegativities, don't cancel, then it's polar. Now, hydrogen bonding, you have to have a really special set of circumstances for there to be hydrogen bonding. First of all, there has to be a hydrogen atom, but not just any old hydrogen atom. There also has to be a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine, only one of those three atoms. And in addition to having both a hydrogen atom and either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, you have to have that hydrogen directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atom. It's not sufficient that there's hydrogen atoms and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atoms in the molecule, the hydrogen, there has to be at least one hydrogen directly attached right on one of those three atoms. Then there's hydrogen bonding, and if there is, that's the strongest of the intermolecular forces. Now, ionic bonding is, is not really an intermolecular force, it's more like an intramolecular force, but, but it's, it's still a little bit different. So I'm gonna throw it in here and just realize that this, these, that ionic bonding is a stronger force than hydrogen bonding is. And incidentally, so is covalent bonding. So let's look at a few molecules. Methane, CH4. Um, you know, okay, so you, to determine what kind of intermolecular forces there are, um, you want to see if it's polar or not first to see if there's dipole, dipole. Because, you know, everything has dispersion, that's, that's given. So is this polar? Well, you can look at it really, you don't even have to draw the Lewis structure like, like I did, because you know that all the outer atoms 
that are attached to the central atom, none of them, none of these bonds are going to be polar because, well, a couple, you know, there's a couple of ways, by the way. Um, it's really useful to remember that carbon and hydrogen bonds are not polar, they're nonpolar. Um, but if you do the difference in electronegativity, remember carbon is 2.5, hydrogen is 2.1, the difference is 0.4, which makes it a nonpolar bond. So as, if you don't have any polar bonds, then it doesn't matter what, that's a nonpolar molecule. Not, so there's no hydrogen bonding because there's no nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and it's not polar. So the only intermolecular force present in methane are dispersion forces. Now, methylene fluoride, CH3F, this molecule here, it does have a polar bond in it. Fluorine's electronegativity is 4.0, carbon is 2.5, the difference is 1.5. So we have a polar bond. The outer atoms are not the same as each other. So remember, if the outer atoms are not the same as each other, and there's at least one polar bond, then we have a polar molecule. And so this is polar, and that means that there are dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. Now, yes, there are both types of intermolecular forces, but by far the most important, the intermolecular force that will determine how this molecule behaves are the, is the strongest, which will be the dipole-dipole forces. What do I mean by how does it behave? Well, what temperature it boils at, if it's a liquid at, you know, what temperature it freezes at, if it's a liquid at this temperature or that temperature, that kind of thing. Now, hydrogen fluoride here, okay, so what kind of intermolecular forces? That's the question. Of course, there's dispersion. Um, is this a polar molecule? Well, yeah, I mean, fluorine's 4.0, hydrogen is 2.1, so the difference is 1.9. It's definitely a, a polar bond, so it's a polar molecule because there's just one bond. So there are dipole-dipole forces, but there are all, there's also hydrogen bonding because we have a hydrogen directly attached to a fluorine atom. Remember, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, with the hydrogen directly attached. And because we have that, the strongest and most important type of intermolecular force in this molecule will be hydrogen bonding. Another molecule in which hydrogen bonding is quite important is water, H2O. That has two hydrogens directly attached to an oxygen. Um, and that hydrogen bonding gives rise to some of the really important properties of water that allow life as we know it to exist on Earth. And now to look at this, sodium hydroxide, this is an ionic compound. You know this because there's a metal and a non-metal, um, or a cation and an anion. The anion is a polyatomic ion here, hydroxide, OH minus. The cation is sodium, anion's hydroxide. Um, so it's an ionic ionic bonding, which is, but there's, that's, you know, that's all we really care about, is that there's ionic bonding here. So let's look at how solutions form now that we know about intermolecular forces. So we have this rule down here, like dissolves like, and I'm going to try to explain this. So this picture on your left here is trying to describe how an ionic compound, like maybe sodium chloride, will dissolve when you put it into water. So when it's a solid, it ends up that the cations, the plus charge here represent, represents, let's say, sodium cation. The minus, the magenta, would be the chloride, you know, you know, whatever the anion is. And so the solid, when you drop a crystal of ion, an ionic compound into water, it starts out as a solid where the, the positive charges are trying to get as far away from each other as they can. So are the negative charges, but they're all stuck together because the opposite charges hold this thing together really tightly. But when you put it into water, which is a polar molecule, um, and by the way, which exhibits hydrogen bonding with itself, but the, the important thing is that it's polar. And remember, the negative part of this molecule will be by the oxygen because it's more electronegative, and we show this with a little delta with a negative sign. That with this sign over here, the, the little curly thing, that's showing that there's a little negative charge on the oxygen. And this with a positive, showing that there's a little positive charge on the hydrogen. So what's gonna happen is, the water molecules are gonna orient themselves when that crystal of salt is in that water, so that the negative part of the water molecule, the oxygen, is bumping up against the, the positively charged sodium ion. It's attracted to it, and it's gonna start pulling on it, and pulling on it, and pulling on it. Now, one molecule of water is not strong enough to pull this cation away from the anions, but there's a lot of water molecules. They kind of gang up on this guy, and they pull it away, and so they start pulling it away, then start slipping in between it and the, and the anion, and pretty soon they have it surrounded on all sides, and then it's pulled apart and it's dissolved. It's, we say it's solvated. The opposite, and the same is true, but with the opposite charges, with the anions, let's say the chloride ions, 
the water molecules, when they come up here, the positive part of the water molecule will be attracted towards the negative um, ion, the anion. And it, again, it'll start pulling, pulling, pulling. They'll gang up on it, pull it away, and pretty soon surround it. The only difference between this picture and what happens with the, the anion is the anion is going to have the positive part, the hydrogens on the water molecule, pointing in towards it when it's surrounded. Now, what, just real quickly, though, remember, in real life, this is a three-dimensional picture. So we have the, the water molecules like making a sphere around the, the ions. And that's how it gets dissolved, this, this, um, this ionic compound. In, and notice that um, the way that it worked is we had to have these electric charges, negatives and positives, on the water molecule. So that would not work if we had a nonpolar compound, a, a, a solvent that was nonpolar, because there's no negative or positive parts that can pull the ions away from each other. And so if we put salt into something that's nonpolar, it will not dissolve. We need polar molecules to dissolve this ionic compound. Now if we take a molecule of methanol, which is also polar, and put it into water, or not just a molecule, but some methanol, what's going to happen is the water molecules will orient themselves so that the negative part of the water molecule, the oxygen, will be really close to the positive part of the, of the methane molecule, in this case the hydrogen, and likewise the positive part of the water, the hydrogens, will bump up on the negative part of the methanol molecule, the oxygen, and they'll surround this molecule and it'll be dissolved. It'll be surrounded by water molecules. And uh, you know, as long as there's enough room, keep putting methanol in there, it'll keep the, the getting surrounded by water molecules. And what'll happen is, because methanol and water are both clear and have about the same densities, you won't be able to, it'll look just clear. You won't be able to see anything. And the, the reason, by the way, why you can't see the sodium chloride back here on the left, over here, when it dissolves is because atoms are small to see. So when they're all together, when there's you know 10 to the 23rd of them or so, then you can see them because there's a lot of them. But when you start pulling them apart, you can't see the individual atoms. And then it looks like it's clear. Well, it is clear, just you can't see the atoms. Now over here, if we take something that's non-polar, this is pentane, it ends up, doesn't matter. It's all carbons and hydrogens, nothing polar, it's a non-polar molecule. Put this into water, there's, there's no attraction of the water molecules for this, not much. There's a much stronger attraction of the water molecules for each other. And so they're going to kind of congregate by themselves. They're going to hang out by themselves, and they kind of don't want anything to do with the oil molecules, the pentane, whatever it is, because they're nonpolar. So the nonpolar molecules will, will cluster together. They're held together um, by these dispersion forces. And the water molecules are held together by the hydrogen bondings. And... They, they don't mix. And so if you put oil and water together, you can see two separate layers. The oil's on top because it's less dense. Water's on the bottom because it's more dense. And they don't mix no matter how much you shake it because they don't have similar types of intermolecular forces. And that, you guys, is what like dissolves like means. It means that a, uh, a substance will dissolve another substance whose polarity is similar. So something that's polar will dissolve in something that's polar. Something that's nonpolar will dissolve in something that's nonpolar, but something that's polar and something will not dissolve something that's nonpolar.